of my mentors did not leave books and classes and stuff behind, left very little behind. And the only people that have it, it are guys like me and Ken and Chuck, who have it between our ears. And I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to die, take it all with me. I want to give all of it away as, as much as I can. And so when you get that script, don't hesitate to use it. Uh, share it with other people I, if it's okay. This is not secret. It's not mystical or magical. It's, it's something that makes our society and it makes the real estate industry better to do it this way. And that's my Jim Wilson opinion for what it's worth. Welcome all of you. It is a delight to be here with you. Um, this particular class was created for a specific purpose. Now there's some secondary purposes that come with it, but this particular workshop was designed around trying to give everybody in a single day as at least some introduction to all of the major segments of equity marketing and to show how those particular segments of equity marketing not only build on each other, but they also have that network effect of this one supports that one and that one supports that one. And, and if you can take these things in and make them the parts of them that work for you. None of this came from a mountain on Clay Athens, okay? These are things that have been done over and over, and I will tell you, there is nothing in the material we're going to share today that I have not done or that I do not have first-hand knowledge of that it works. It usually regularly works because it's important that, that you get introduced to things that really work, that you can put into your toolbox. And that's the under some of the underlying parts of what this, this workshop is about. And that is, you know, I see some faces in here that probably could be up here teaching this, <laughs> okay? But when I go to a class, I've taken some classes six and seven times. Why? Because you hear them at a different level every time you go take the class. Because you grow and you expand and your experiences get better. So one of the things I'm hoping that we do today is remind many of you of some concepts and principles and, and, and techniques and skills that you haven't thought about for a while. And the second thing is I hope that we can give you a few pieces that we where we share some experiences, we share some examples. We give you some forms, we give you some analysis approach that you might go home that you don't have in your toolbox today, that you might add to your toolbox so that you can be more effective. You know, have, how many of you would like to close on at least 80% of all the things that you work on? Okay? <laughs> I'm not quite sure when at 80%. But since I became an equity marketer, and I chose, and I'm telling you this because this is a prejudice. You need to know what my biases are too, okay? So that you can take the material I'm giving you, put it into your gray matter computer and see if it, it makes sense. I chose after about three or four years of trying to be in commercial investment list and sell real estate that I couldn't do that very well. And I started working from the premise of equity marketing back in those days, it was called exchanging, which says that the most important factor in conducting the business is whether or not there is a, an effective, a positive or a negative beneficial interest of the owner to the property. Now the property is important. I'm a CCIO too, I don't pay my dues anymore, but I are one. <laughs> uh, you got to know how to analyze the property. You got to know about the property. But the factor that will put transactions to closing is whether or not this is a beneficial transaction for the owner of that property in that location under that owner's lifestyle context or life context, financial context at that particular moment in time. And that's, that's, that's what we're about in marketing sessions, 
because equity marketing includes buyers and sellers and exchangers and finance people and creative formulas and solve the problem <coughs> by rehabbing the project. It's all part of how do we achieve the goal of allowing the owner of that property to achieve the maximum effective benefits of ownership. And it may have absolutely nothing what to do, ever to do with price and terms. And that's, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And, and I hope that, that we can share some things that, that will be beneficial and give you a <clears throat> give you a reason to have spent the time to that. So let's let's move on here. Our objective is to understand the principles that call. Principles don't change. Policies change. Applications change. Principles don't change. That calls real estate transactions to be initiated and close. And close. Now I know that most of you don't have this problem where you are, but in Florida, we will occasionally take a list of it doesn't close and we don't get paid gosh you know sucker you know expires and they list it with somebody else i, I know you all don't do that but we do that before. understand how counseling i don't like the word counseling i'm telling you my prejudice i prefer the word discovery you know it's kind of like the attorneys you know, all of you i'm sure have been on on jury duty at one time they have this discovery period where they ask questions to figure out you know, where, where people stand. I like to call it discovery. Understanding how the discovery process identifies the client's true objectives. If you know what you're trying to accomplish, isn't it easier to go get it done? It is in my experience. Understand property information needed for effective marketing. Understand property analysis and diligence. I just love it when when people come and say, well, I've got this listing on the way over here. <laughs> Boy, you just know they know all about the property and the owner, what they're trying to achieve. Understand property enough. Understand the application of creative transaction formulas. While you're in a marketing session, I see a lot of marketing session veterans in here, and, and so hopefully you'll, you'll back me up on this, but when you're in the marketing session, there are all kinds of creative solutions that come to light as we're progressing through our presentations in order to do what? Establish, have, and take the context. You know, you, you need to pay attention to where that guy in the back is him. Everybody look like you see this guy. <laughs> pay attention to where he's sitting because a lot of those creative ideas will come out of his mouth and may not have anything to do with the deal that you're going to get in, right? right. That's the difference. We're going to talk about how equity marketing sessions are collaborative and cooperative. See, he's in Colorado and I'm in Florida, but you see, we're, we're in business together because when we try to work out a transaction, the object of the game is I'm trying to move out of benefits from my client that don't fit what they need now into potentially benefits in something he's offering that do not fit the benefits his client needs. So we're in business together. We have a different company name, we have a different you know, state license, but we're colleagues. And and sometimes you you just step up and say, hey, well, how, why, why not try this in order to solve that problem? And I haven't seen the agenda, but I suspect there's a most motivated or a problem solver session going to be in this marketing session. And that's where a lot of those ideas come. Anyway, non-real estate assets, mortgages, and I'm talking about existing mortgages on which you're collecting money. You know, you can sign the mortgage. Mortgages, mailbox money, isn't it? right? Mortgages, boats. Um, we had an all-cash offer among the marketing session results some years ago for guys' property in Ohio, and we, I, I saved the all-cash full-price offer to the last. We always make my people look at all that. Well, one of the offers was a 57-foot Morgan sailboat with a condo you know, boat slip in Olympia, Washington. And I presented that, and I got down to the all-cash offer. Guess what he took? He took the sailboat. Why? Because his brother was a licensed uh, sea captain, and they went out to, to Washington and went sailing all of the time. 
And the guy had enough money, he could afford to do that. So he took the sailboat and the condo boat slip and started the all cash. You never, who could tell? And so there's a lot of other things that, that, that people offer. This is one of the things that we always ask about. Tell me, I'm just curious, if, if we have a problem getting attention in a market, do you have any other things that you could maybe throw in the deal as a bonus if somebody would, would, would come and make you an offer? And then showed up, he was speaking next to the suits. And you find out all kinds of, oh yeah, we bought two lots and filled in the blank like Tansy a few years ago. Yeah, we decided we're never ever going to go up there and build. Or, you know, I have a condo in San Diego and my daughter used to live there, but now we're renting and it's a problem. I just do not have that. Oh yeah, I can throw in a hundred thousand bucks, a million dollars, fill in the blank. Oh really? <laughs> you know, what, what could you do? 13,000 bottles from on, a real deal. And it, it made a deal. The guy got the 13,000 bottles of rum, and he ended up turning it into the cash he needed. How did he get 13,000 bottles of rum? It was a can ad or will ad to balance the equities in another trade. <laughs> okay? So, all kinds of things. services. If you're an attorney, engineer, uh, had a guy who was an earth mover, got moved dirt and did development projects, and he would write $10,000 certificates for earth moving work. And buy real estate thing. Works just fine. Commodities. 10 train car loads of processed compost. <laughs> you know? What else? I mean, I've seen train cars, uh, drag lines, all kinds of stuff. So there, there are a lot of real estate boot items that sometimes are easier to get to cash than maybe some other real estate. Oh, cattle and horses, wonderful. Absolute chickens worked on Sam turkeys. Goldsboro, North Carolina. I mean, turkeys, turkeys are liquid cash on the phone, literally. Yeah, oh, cattle, yeah, absolutely. You just take them to, to the auction and leave me. Yes? So my friend here has used life settlements. Taking yeah. people's life settlement policies. Oh, yeah. Policies. Oh, yeah. And See your life settlements? That we would build in some time years. Yeah, we, we've done a lot of senior life settlement, settlements over the years. You know, you, you get a package of them, lather them up, and you know, it's it's a really good way. And you have a lot of expertise in that, right? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, everybody needs to raise your hand. Everybody needs to get to know him because that is a really great solution to a lot of situations. I was, I was going to say, I mean, I, I don't want to derail anything at all, but I was. I, I, you said something a minute ago that I was like, man, that's a really good idea about how we could all get to know each other. Oh, yeah. I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? So there's, probably, there's probably three or four or five people in here that know exactly what I have. Once they, they know what I have. Right. How do we, how do we go there? Where do we do that? Yeah, you're, I, I, I've had your name come up on brainstorming list probably five or six times over the last two years. We just didn't get to the senior life settlement thing. Uh, as being uh, get up on the top of the priority list, but your name's always on that list when that's one of our considerations. Understanding the process and steps to use in order to get a multi-way trade. How many have done an exchange transaction with more than three legs in it? Why not? Why not? They're not that hard. Well, I have an idea why they're not. Because in 49 years of doing this and going to classes, I've never seen anybody present the steps and what you do in order to make that happen. So I'm hoping, if nothing else, that you'll walk out of here this afternoon with at least understanding why guys like me and, and, and Blake back there at three, four, five, way trade, whatever it takes in order to what? Achieve the objectives of my client. We're going to talk about all of those things in, in real uh, hard knuckle day terms. Okay, <clears throat> understanding effective contracting and closing procedures. Now I know that all of you are familiar with contracting, but when you start putting a multi-way, multiple property transaction together, your contracting has some additional pieces that you need to know about, and you will know about them and have copies of it when you leave today. 
How do you use proactive uh, recognizing and understanding multiple marketing venues? Now, actually, my very favorite part of this whole day is how to use proactive marketing. And I'm going to leave it to say right now uh, that proactive marketing is the means by which you take over control of whether somebody may, you know, accept your transaction and when, when they're going to act and when they're going to respond to your offer. So that's how you take control of whether the market's going to respond. And you can greatly reduce, anybody interested in reducing your advertising and marketing time and effort and getting more results, this is one of the ways to do that. We're going to, we're going to spend some time on that. Learn how equity marketing principles and concepts benefit the entire real estate market. <clears throat> they told me I had to throw in one of these radio statements, and that's it. <laughs> Think about this. This sounds logical and, and as a gimme. Real estate only has value in relationship to people. And there's two levels of that. The value of, of the real estate has one value because of the number of people that can utilize the benefits of that property. What about a farm in Iowa? It's all the people who buy the produce off of that farm, right? Or the production off of that farm that gives it some level of value. And the other level of value has to do <clears throat> with the benefits of that property at that particular time to the person who's going to own it. So that kind of explains why there's a little difference between the value of an acre of northern Utah or Arizona, you know, what, what they call it, bullet hole land. <laughs> Y'all know what bullet hole land is? You put your sign out there, when you come back two months later, it's full bullet holes because that's what they use for the target practice. <clears throat> bullet hole land. Highest and best use, hold the earth together at that particular spot. <laughs> and the difference between that and an acre of downtown Manhattan. Why? Because they stack them, you know, 90 stories tall and more people can utilize them, et cetera, et cetera. So the value of real estate really has to do with people. The people are going to use the benefits of that property. And here's the, here's the primary underlying premise in my opinion. Keyword, my opinion. You have your own opinion, but this is the one that I have worked with now probably since the middle 70s. People should only acquire, continue to own, and dispose of property because of the benefit relationship of the property to the owner at any one specific time. The operative word here is should. Why do you think we have so many people that make bad decisions? Why are there so many bad decisions in real estate? And I, I know you've seen, I've seen people buy the wrong thing for the wrong price at the wrong time. People sell when they should not sell. They, they, they don't do an exchange when they should do an exchange. Why, why do people do that? People keep properties on my green and they go, this I'm going to keep it. Mm. Okay? Except for the fact that now it's, oh, we're going to a situation like that right now. Granddaddy bought this piece of dirt and it was a fabulous piece of dirt when Granddaddy bought it in the 70s. Lakefront, front, all that good stuff. And Granddaddy's dead. And the property should have been sold in the, you know, probably in the late 90s. And guess what? Today, it has almost no marketing demand. And the value, if we can find a taker for it, is probably half what it would have been in 1996, 97. <coughs> they should have sold it. Why didn't they do that? Because they never paid attention to it. They didn't even go out there and drive by it to find out that the neighbors had cut all the damn trees off of it and sold the wood. It was covered with hardwood. Okay? I had a friend of mine in New Jersey. And fellow inherited five acres of, of really quality land, good location with lots of hardwood for keepers and oaks. They went out and looked at it. 
Guess what? Five years later, click on it. Anybody have an idea of what a hundred year old hickory trunk might be worth today? Maybe $40,000. So that's why we have pre wrestlers. Okay? So if you pay attention to it, a lot of bad decisions would be avoided if people paid attention to it. And attention to benefits includes attention to risk. Attention to what's the risk? There are a whole lot of risks. Will it hold its value? Um, so attention to risk. What kind of risks are financial risk? Physical risk to the property. You know, what's the chances <laughs> that somebody might come out there in the middle of the night and rustle your really valuable hardwood trees. Isn't that a risk? So a lot of people do not pay attention to the risk factors that are involved in what they're doing. Benefits continuum. It's actually a continuum. Over here on, on this side is zero pain. I mean, this baby is just working on it great, you know, cash flows coming out, there's no management problem, I got long-term leases on it, uh, we just, you know, we have, we have a big store on it, an insurance company just put a new roof on there, got it made, I don't have to think about this, I'm just going to move to Tahiti and get my checks and bottle every third time, no big deal, right? <laughs> well, what happens, and many years ago I took a, a, a appraisal class with a guy down in Texas and I'll never forget his open mind. He said, you know, property ownership's a lot like being born. From the time you, you're born, you start to rot. You know? <laughs> and it gets worse the further along you go sometimes. And I live in a cemetery waiting room, one of those senior housing things with about 1,500 homes. And, you know, there's a lot of rotting going on in there, you know. <laughs> I mean, my wife and I are looked on as one of the younger couples, you know, that's great. It makes you feel good. But here's what happens. You acquire a property for a set of benefits. And the longer you own it, the more that set of benefits begins to change. And so when you, when you think about that, how do you know when it's time to, to go out of title? Well, you have to watch it. I recommend, and most of my clients actually do this now, they will do an analysis of their ownership benefits about every couple of years. Some, some of them are, are understand how to do that themselves and are capable and will. Some of them say, you know, turn on your meter, Jim. It's time for us to look at you know, what, what should we keep, what should we exchange, et cetera. And so, any, any CCIU in here? Appreciate that, don't you? Mm -hmm. No? I guess. Oh, he's oh, oh, he is. Well, one of the one of the things that if you go through the CI program, and by the way, it, as, as far as I'm concerned, it is the finest investment analysis education you can go get anywhere. You know, I have participated in the university uh, real estate programs over the years many times at CCI. I'm still teaching the better material. So if you think about it, with an income property. You acquire it today and boy, it's just working like great. But what happens? Rents go up, values go up, mortgage interest rate, go, interest deductions go down, depreciation, cost for recovery, excuse me, I'm telling my age. <laughs> cost for recovery stays flat. You reach a point at which what happens? More and more and more of your income is taxable. By the way, principal payments on a mortgage are what? Not tax deductible, are they? Any of you, you ever dealt with any of the old uh, Walgreens leases? So a lot of those are professionals, man. Fixed rate, you know, 99% financing, et cetera. And a whole bunch of those came on the market about seven, eight years ago. And the reason was, is because at that particular point in time, the, the interest deduction had dropped off so far and the principal payments on the mortgage were so high that their after-tax return was now negative. And a whole bunch of doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs said, holy crap, that wasn't where I bought. 
<laughs> and they tried to get rid of them. Many of them had to buy their way out. And so there is a point at which your after tax, and that's the only return that really counts, isn't it? Your after tax return starts to drop off. Is it time to sell? Well, maybe. Maybe you just refinance. Maybe you upgrade. Uh, maybe you do a 1031 exchange. But the object of the game is, is to know when it's time to think about making a change of benefits. Notice I did not say a sale or an exchange or any of those things. I said to change the function of the benefits of ownership. That's an important thing. You know, I, I have discovery sessions with clients, and I say, you know, I, I don't think you ought to be going out of title with that. And they look at me and they say, isn't that how you make your commissions? <laughs> yeah, but I'd rather make commissions for the next 30 or 40 years from you and all of your friends than have you go do something that's not good for you. I have a form, I haven't used it in a long time, that says, you know, I have hereby uh, recommended that you not undertake the action, and I have to describe the action uh, in, in in relationship to your mortgage or your real estate. And I need you to acknowledge in writing that I have told you this, that you should not do this. <laughs> that will usually get their attention. You know, if I think they shouldn't do something that I would get paid for them doing, it usually will get their attention. And so it's important to think about what the benefit relationship is and how far you get across that continuum before it's time to do something. <clears throat> One of them is cash flow. We talked about that already. That's net cash in your hand after all the real expenses, not the BS expenses that you're writing off your wife's sports car and all of that stuff. But all the real expenses, you know, we used to have, I was saying in, in the CCIM program, because they use a thing called an annual property operating data statement, APOD. How do you spell lie, A-P-O-D? Because I can make that sucker say anything you want it, want it to say. You just change the criteria, okay? Um, but the key there is, how about after tax benefits? Because that's the only one that really counts. That's the part that you get to keep. Now, can you have a negative cash flow property with a positive after-tax benefit? Is that possible? Some of you are old enough to remember the, the bad old days of double declining balance depreciation. <laughs> and and I, I saw a lot of people that bought properties with a negative cash flow on the first day of ownership. And a bunch more of them in California than in Florida. And, and many of those people were reaping an after-tax return of maybe 16, 18% because they were saving so many tax dollars. Now these were high tax bracket people. But yeah, so it, it has to do with after tax is the one that really counts. And by the way, don't give tax advice if you're not licensed to do that. That's why I got into the CPS and tax attorneys. It's capital accumulation. I buy it for a dollar and I hold it for some period of time and maybe I do something to it and I make it worth three dollars. That's capital appreciation. Capital and wealth accumulation. Very high tax, um, high tax bracket people will often acquire properties that sort of, you know, the best diligence says it's in the path of progress. It's going to greatly increase in value because of what's happening in the market or they're building a road there, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is that a really good deal for high income tax, high income person? Absolutely, because why? You don't pay taxes each year on the increase in value. You only pay taxes when you go out of title. If you go out of title in a taxable transaction, that make sense? So it has to do with what? The people relationship. So a second benefit of property is capital appreciation. Another benefit is personal use. I'm gonna put my business there, I'm gonna farm it. Um, personal use, direct use. Business operation, what is business operation for real estate? I'm gonna buy this piece of dirt, I'm gonna cut it up, 
will turn into single family lots and put in streets and roads. And I'm going to either build houses and sell them or I'm going to sell the lots to a builder and build houses on them. That's, that's, that's a business operator. Guess what? Those properties do not qualify for 1031 exchange. Okay? That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's a big no-no. And I have seen a number of people get into big trouble doing that. You know, if you exchange your office building for, say, a package of 20 single-family rental houses, and then you start selling them off one or two at a time, Guess what IRS might come back and say, and I've seen this happen, uh, gosh, you just bought those and that's the inventory on your shelf. So that's not 1031 property. That's business property. And guess what? They lost. <laughs> happened in Ohio. They lost big time. And the tax bill was really big. So pay attention to those things. Tax savings. Are there any tax savings left in real estate today? Is it? What's one of the tax savings in real estate today? How about 1031 exchange? That work? How about cost recovery? Is that a tax benefit of owning real estate? Oh yeah. How about depletion enough allowance? Does anybody know what depletion allowance is? You know, if you're drilling for oil, you're digging for coal or gold or whatever, <clears throat> you get a, a tax deduction each year. Uh, for the depletion of the asset. Now we have we have some really nifty people in, in Florida. In Florida, we have two users that require land that has the water table at least 20 feet below the surface. Now that's not much in Florida. That's only something like 12 percent of all the land in Florida. All right. And the two users are what? Garbage landfills and underground carbon, I mean a cemetery. <laughs> okay? Now the cemeteries, they sell it by the square foot, so they can usually pay them. But there are certain properties that, that just don't work well for them. And especially if they've got clay or sand or gravel or something on it. So the, the company comes in and they start mining the clay, gravel, sand, whatever, and they get a depletion allowance while they're digging the hole. And they get down to the point where there's no more of the good stuff to sell. So they now sell that to somebody else who turns it into a landfill. And now they take a depletion allowance as they fill the hole back up. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. If you know the rules, you, you can make some benefits. But the, the, the key there is there are tax savings associated because real estate ownership is a tax advantage investment. Okay. How about a repository of wealth? Look at my magic wand here. You all have a billion dollars in your bank account. What are you going to do with it? By the way, on a worldwide basis, it's probably shrinking up at about three and a half percent a year to inflation. What are you going to do with it? You're not going to do a $10 million deal you can't live long enough. What are, you going to, what are you going to invest it in in order to keep it from shrinking up and hold its value? Well, one of the major things that people use, or institutions especially, you know, if you're Harvard University and what, they have $40 billion in their foundation, what do you do with it? Well, one of the things that Harvard owns is, I don't know how many thousands of acres of timberland in Northern Idaho. And you know, it's all full of hardwood timber, and you know, the odds are pretty good that that timberland is going to hold its value. Another foundation of the University uh, Athletic Association some years ago bought a big chunk of Wyoming, and the reason was it had 380,000 uh, estimated tons of graphite in the ground, proven re the reserves. And they bought it. Why? Anybody know what graphene is? It's a very high quality form of graphite uh, and carbon. And one of the primary uses of it is in uh, energy cells and in batteries. <clears throat> Think there's any future in owning graphite? 
in the ground mm -hmm. the reserve? Sure. So one of the reasons that you own real estate, yeah, especially if you're trying to hoard a lot of wealth, is it's a great repository of wealth. Defining people benefits. Some properties offer di different benefits to different owners depending upon their financial, business expertise, family, lifestyle, social situation, and other factors. You know, I, this is common sense stuff. There are certain people that have advantages for owning certain types of property. I have some folks that do apartments and they're very, very knowledge knowledgeable and experienced in apartments. They have property management facilities and maintenance facilities in several cities in the Northeast. And so they can take on an apartment complex problem that, that might be a real problem to somebody else and, and turn that into a, a real premium property. They can also take a property <clears throat> that they can pay market value for and because of their economies of scale and knowledge expertise of the market, they can end up making two or three percent return per year more than the average investor who pays the market value for that property. You know, how about the uh, the person I have a we'll, and we're gonna talk about this and some other things. I have a kid going to college, and so uh, I, boy, the, the cost of housing is really getting up there these days. So I'm gonna go buy a duplex, fourplex, 10 units, whatever, in the college town, move my kid in, he's gonna, he or she is going to be the property manager, or they are gonna be the property manager, and we're gonna leave them there for the four to six years it takes to get their undergraduate degree, and maybe another two or three years to get their graduate degree, and then I'll sell the apartments to recoup all of the money, you know, and that actually works, and I've done some of that myself, around a number of different university areas over the years. And yes, if it, yeah, you do it correctly, it works well, and sometimes you make a profit over and above the savings on housing, okay? However, that's a two-edged story because your, your kid just got the master's degree in underwater basket weaving and uh, left-handed tomahawk throwing. And they're getting ready to leave because they have a job in North Dakota throwing tomahawks with their left hand. And guess what? You just lost your property manager. How many of you want to live in Florida and own a 10 unit uh, student apartment house in, <laughs> in Missouri and, and hire a local manager to take care of that for you? How many of you want to do that? No, you don't want to do that. I, I owned a 12-unit apartment, a student apartment in Athens, Georgia once. And I solved the management problem for a while because I hired the captain of the wrestling team as my in-house property manager. And then he graduated. And then I paid somebody to take over the ownership of those units. I really did. So it, it all depends on what? On, on the circumstances of the owner. Does that make sense? So we're, we're leading up to something here. We'll get there. Categories of people benefits positive. I need this property to expand my business. I want to expand my farm. I want, I'm going to buy the 200 acres next door. Uh, I need a place in Tampa to, to put a, a branch. I need to move the hell out of California and move into Utah and irritate John and all those people up there in Reno. <laughs> okay? So, I have a positive. How about a negative use? Um, my, my Dayton, Ohio shopping center has just become 45% vacant. The roof is bad. Part of the reason the tenant moves out is because the roof leaks like a sieve every time it rains. And, oh, by the way, the current income is now not enough to pay for the taxes, insurance, maintenance, and the mortgage payment. I'm a little short each month, several thousand dollars, as a matter of fact. And guess what? I have a tenant who would like to move in there, but I don't have the $120,000 that it would take to do the tenant improvements to get that person in. You, you think they're motivated to make a transaction? That's a negative motivation. Uh, 
not based on factor reason. Now, I realize in most of your areas you've never run into this, but in Florida, we will occasionally get the person who says, oh, I bought this two years ago for X million dollars. And by the way, for those of you who don't understand about Florida, it is downhill from New England. <laughs> when people let go in New England, they slide right downhill. Some of them stop in the Carolinas, but a lot of them just keep sliding on down and they get into Florida, and they just sold their 1,450 square foot house in Boston for a million three. And they get to Florida and they got a million three in their pocket, and you'll find out that they can get a 5,000 square foot house in Florida for about 500,000 bucks. And now they got a million dollars to go buy something else. And guess what? They haven't a clue, so they pay too much for it. Okay? So I, I bought this for $2 million a couple of years ago. And I put a half a million dollars of improvements in it. And uh, I want to sell this for uh, $2.5 million plus about a 10% return per year. So my price is going to be $2,990,000. Except that the current market has gone totally in the toilet because this is a 30 year old metal building uh, self storage facility uh, which has now had a new Wawa uh, gas station built in front of it. You know, you know what Wawa is? That's one with the 2,904 tanks and all the gas and you know, sandwiches and stuff. Uh, and so they just built a new Wawa in front of my property. And so what do you think the odds are of that property holding this down? A lot of that goes around. So one of, the, one of the keys is to understand when you're working with somebody to take the listing or consider whether or not they, they will be a client, then I want you to think about it in terms of, is this a positive reason to make a transaction? Is this a negative reason to make a transaction? Are these people crazy? <laughs> no, that's the only reason I want to bring this up. So you understand, because what? Why do people go to closing? Because of motivation, <coughs> right? So if their only motivation is to find the greater fool who will pay me more than what I'm waiting for, because I don't care whether I make a deal or not, is there any motivation there? I don't think so. To people specialized in management, <coughs> leasing knowledge, contact, construction, development, expertise. If you if you have a lot of construction and development expertise and experience, do you have an advantage over somebody who doesn't when you're buying a rehab or you turn around property? Absolutely. You know, there was a there was an apartment complex outside of Chicago some years ago, and it had been irrationally neglected by the the owners who had inherited it from daddy and uncle, whoever. And they were going to hire a general contractor and the cost, this, this is 531 units and 279 units were not habitable. They had been cannibalized to keep the rest of them working. And so the general contractor had come in and they had estimated $31,000 per unit to rehab the units. And somebody who had that hands-on experience ended up being the supervisor. Yeah, it took a few years. But they understood that you never let the contractor buy the materials. You buy the materials, you take the discount, you, know, you hire them for their labor, and so all of those kinds of things you buy. You, know, you, you don't buy two air conditioners, you buy 200, which means that the price drops by about 60% if you do that. Want to take a wild guess what the actual cost to rehab those units was per unit? You know what we guessed? Twelve. Five? Actually, $4,980 something like that. And that included new cabinets, new appliances, and they at least had the wall shaker air conditioners. Still don't understand. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's an advantage. Geographic advantages. You know, I live there, or my uncle's there, my cousin's there, I have a property management division there. Etc. Cash resources. If you got cash resources, you can do things that other people can't. We had the cash resources, so instead of buying two air conditioners at a time, we bought 200. And we were able to cut a deal, so we only had to take delivery on 25 at a month. And guess what? The company delivered the units, one to each one of the units, and it was going to go in that day. 
you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this. If you've got cash, you can reduce the mortgage. You can rehab, you can pay tenant improvements. Cash is a real advantage. Credit's the same way. What if you have the cash, but you don't have any inclination as to what you want to do, but you would like to have a nice 10, 12, 15% return? What would you do? What are you going to do? Anybody? Talk to me. Right. Yeah, yeah, come to a marketing session because why? There's probably going to be about 20 opportunities in there where we've got the arms and legs, we've got the knowledge, we've got the experience, we've got the, the reputation, we've got the, the whole resume, but we need money. And so if you've got the cash, you can become the passive investor. It's an advantage. Credit resources, same way. We'll find people say, hey, we need somebody to sign on the debt, and we will give X amount of return to the to the party for doing that. Direct use of a specific property. You know, I, I'm in the refrigerated food distribution business, so therefore I would be interested in a refrigerated warehouse. For those of you who are not familiar with it, refrigerated and freezer warehouses right now are the hottest item on the market. I mean, they're, they're going in four caplets on a grand scale. Anyway. Property requires low or no maintenance management. You know, I want to get in the motor home, go see the grandkids in Phoenix. I was, I don't want anything to do with it because I'm going to own some Burger King's, Dollar General's, uh, Dollar Tree's, fill in the way. And it's a triple net lease. I will tell you, over the years, I have experienced the fact that triple net leases have to be attended to at one level or another. Because if you don't go look at them, they really don't take care of the price. They really don't. And so I, I recommend it to my clients, you know, go make a visual, physical inspection about every two years. And you know what? We often find, oh, the cracks in the parking lot. They, <laughs> they, they've got sandbags around the door on the side because the drainage is not working. Go look. It's not a free lunch it's a property, but a lot of people, the primary benefit they want is fewer toilets per square foot, and they just want a mailbox money check. Property can be readily financed. I have an encumbered piece of dirt. I'm tired of feeding this alligator, and I need something where the lovely, wonderful tenants will start paying a mortgage. And so one of the benefits of a property to someone might be that I can readily finance it. Uh, what if you're going out of a title to a property that has a gigantic mortgage over basis problem? Let's call it six million dollars. And you have a six million dollar mortgage over basis problem, and, a and it's a C corp in a state with a big state uh, capital gains tax, uh, and you only have two million dollars equity. You're about a million six short of paying the taxes and the closing costs if you sell it. So what do you have to do? What's the only solution to that? 1031 exchange, right. 1031 exchange, because 1031 exchange, as long as we've got it, is, as far as I know, and I've researched this for years, is the only way to cover up mortgage over basis problems. Okay? So readily financed, because this particular, uh, in this particular transaction, we had to have something that could be readily financed for 80% in order to not have net loan relief, which in an exchange is taxable to the extent of gain. Um, properties free and clear, uh, I have to have cash, uh, I gotta pay an IRS bill, I trade my property free and clear house, I go to Happy National Bank or discount it out, cash it out, pathway to cash. I'm looking for free and clear properties. I might be looking for free and clear properties because I want, I want the seller to take the financing. I'm doing 1031 exchange and I found this really killer property. Oh, I can hardly stand it. It's going to take 85% of all the cash in qualified intermediary and I need some net loan relief coverage. So how about buying a uh, free and clear piece of dirt, Northern Georgia, Utah, or whatever, on a 50 year loan interest only for the first five years? in order to keep from having a net loan relief taxable problem on your exchange. Will that work? Certainly will. 
and everybody in that deal benefits. Rehab, you know, that's what I do. I make money by making it worth more. I don't want any rehab. I don't want to mess with it. I don't like handyman stuff, all right? My wife will not allow me to touch a paintbrush. I can get paint on the bottom of the sofa by painting, you know? I don't want to do that. Uh, government regulatory entitlements. If you have a piece of dirt and it's already approved with a plat and all of that good stuff, is it worth more than the dirt that you could get that on? Oh, you better believe it. And I have some good friends that have developed in California for many years. And I asked the burger one time, I said, you know, boy, you guys pay an outrageous amount of money for your subdivision in order to build houses and sell them. Why in the world do you do that? And he said, well, first of all, I'm too old to spend somewhere between five and seven years in frustration in order to get the entitlements and get the, the plat map or whatever it is they call it in California. So they just quit doing that. And they just paid the price. They still made a good profit. I mean, you know, investing with them makes them make eight percent returns that way. But entitlements are very valuable. Ego benefits. Uh, you know, live at six ocean view in Palm Beach, Florida, and I want to buy the four-story little white office building in the circle downtown where my CPA and my attorney are because I can drive by there and tell people, see that in the youth was mine. You know, and they can talk about it at the country club. This guy, this guy can waste money quicker than anybody I ever met. And when he bought that office building, he bought it losing about $2,000 a month. But he needed it for his ego because he could put you in his Rolls Royce and you drive by and say, it's mine. Now, some people might buy the lot next door so that nobody go to house. <laughs> I've seen people in California buy the property across the street that would block their ocean view if somebody built a two-story house there. <laughs> So it all depends on that. Recreation benefits, I'm going to hunt deer or whatever. Um, others. You, you, you see how long this list is? You see why we're talking about people? And, and when you discover what people's knowledge expertise is, it makes a huge amount of difference. People benefits are directly related. If you want to find somebody who will sign the paper, get somebody who has the people benefits that will motivate them to go out of time or to go into time. People have a need of a different set of property benefits. The people have a need for a different set of property benefits. Property is not inherently bad. West Texas, no, no water for about 40 miles. Just a big chunk of desert holds the earth together at that particular spot. And we're in Atlanta, Georgia, at an NCI marketing session with about 200 people there. And the fellow's standing up there presenting this property. And we're all shaking our head. Who in the world wants a piece of desert West Texas with no water? And the guy in the back gets his number. The only person in this 200 something attendee marketing session. It's a five day marketing session, by the way. And so <laughs> the moderator says, Stand up, what are you going to do with that? God, you know, this is a piece of crap land. The guy turns out to have a master's degree in herpetology. Anybody know what herpetology is? That's reptiles. Because the presenter said, You can't even go ride a horse out there because it's alive with rattlesnakes. And this guy had a business on the side. He was a professor at Florida State University, but he had a business on the side of milking rattlesnakes and making anything. So the first thing they did was go out there and build a fence around the land to keep the snakes in. <laughs> and they put a little shed out there and they drive out there with a truck and a tank with water and stuff. And as far as I know, thank God, that's been 20 something years ago. As far as I know, they're still out there milking rattlesnakes. See, there's no bad real estate. There's only non-beneficial ownership. <clears throat> have a take the principle. Take or have a principle. This is so simple that most people miss it and never even think about it. 
you cannot, and I, I first learned this when I was selling kitchen knives door to door while I was still in the Air Force. You cannot sell anything until you, you, you find somebody who will take what you're offering. On the other side, you cannot get closing until you find somebody who's offering what you want. So if you go in there and they just love your three hundred some dollar set of kitchen knives, which was an outrageously expensive set of kitchen knives in those days, but they didn't have any money. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, my manager wanted money. The company wanted cash. So they taught us to ask the right questions. Well, what if we could finance this over six months or a year? Oh, that worked. I have. This will tell you how long ago. I would have people give me cases of pop bottles that I could come down to the store and sell the pop bottles for the down payment on the finance set of kitchen knives. And it works the same way with real estate. So if you if you will start to take the taker and the haver apart and recognize that they don't have to be the same party, then you can absolutely magnify the opportunities to get to closing. I need cash, but I have the world's lousiest piece of real estate. People go out there and drive by and throw up. It's so bad. <laughs> Nobody's going by, but man, I've got to have cash right now. So what if I can find somebody who will take that, but they're offering 13,000 bottles of rum. What am I going to do with that? What do you think we did with it? We traded it to Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, who gave us a whole stack of cruise certificates, which we took to a promotion company and sold them at a discount for cash. That worked. We did. Worked just fine. We, we, we took the papers and had them apart. And, and we, we looked for, we kept our eye on the ball. What we're trying to do is get to the cash that the person absolutely had to have. How many of you really want cash? Not really. See, cash has no intrinsic value. We changed from the barter system about 150 years ago to the money system. And since then, the money system has gotten more and more and more in control. And so people think that cash has value. The only time I've ever seen uh, people that did not pass the cash through to what they ultimately wanted was the people that needed the emotional value of cash, and that is, you know, my wife has a certain amount of money that she needs to see in a savings account in the bank. And if that, if we get less than that, I mean, I start getting some bad times. <laughs> you know, it's all heard over, over the plate at night, if we do. Uh, some people need the security of having X amount of dollars in the bank because it gives them the comfort level. I would rather have a negative interest rate after inflation certificate of deposit than and the security of thinking that I can be liquid here. But what are most people going to do with the money? They're going to acquire something else with it, aren't they? Right? Now, one, one of the ways I got introduced to exchanging was one of my very first listings was a little industrial property and the guy wanted $125,000 for it. It was my first commercial sale, and I found a buyer, and, you know, we're, we're walking out of the closing, and I'm happy as a clam. I've made this outrageously big com uh, commission for those days, and I, I just casually said, I said, what are you doing with all that money? He says, oh, I'm buying the property down the street. I already got a contract. We're going to close on that next week. Guess what he was doing that not with me. <laughs> Why didn't I ask that question up front? Why are you selling this? Oh, I need to buy the property down the road because it's bigger and I need the extra space and I need to be in this general location. I could have gone down the street. Got two commissions. Oh, that's better than one. <laughs> so there's a reason that you need to like somebody says, oh, I just want cash. Well, you know, I'm really curious. If, if I just brought your $280,000 in cash in here and poured it up here in the middle of the dining room table and put it all 
this. What in the world would you do with that? And I, I always get, usually get one of the one or two things. This first thing I would do is call Grinch to get on the car on the way over here. And and then you you, you get them to start telling you what the hell we're going to do with the money. Now sometimes they say money is damn business. Okay. Now. It all depends on what my relationship is with that person. You know, I may continue to work with them as a customer, but I suspect they will never be a client. Because if you won't tell me what it is that I need to know in order to do the best job in the world for you, representing you as an agent, then why am I going to continue to work with you? Think about that for a little while. But nobody really wants cash. They're going to do something else with it. And if you can find out what that something else is, it will help you to move your marketing over to another notch. Traditional marketing versus equity marketing. This is pretty simple. I, I, I'm a big advocate of everything we've all done, because I've done it all. Billboards, signs, flyers, the whole nine yards. Uh, put it on loop net. I'm, I'm so old, I remember Pike Net. Peter Pike out of Indianapolis was one of the first online uh, uh, listing programs ever. And use it all. I mean, we used to <laughs> we used to send flyers out by thousands to brokers around the country. And you know what? The problem with that is it only works well when there is a readily available number of buyers with money and credit and credits available. How many of you think credit's a little more difficult today than it was a few years ago? I guarantee you it is. I'm a recovering mortgage banker, and I kept a lot of my contacts. Right now, there are a lot of deals that do not get financed, not because they shouldn't, but because the compliance officer in the bank knows that the compliance people from the Fed and the OTC are going to sit on their shoulder. Okay? There's a lot of rules and regs that have made it, in my opinion, a lot more difficult in order to get financing on a whole wide variety of, of types of problems. Anyway, the problem with traditional marketing is nothing happens until the taker, because you're out there waving a flag, blowing a horn, saying, look at my property, look at my property, but nothing happens until that potential taker does something of their volition on their time frame. Right? And traditional marketing uh, does not generally include anything about the word called benefits. Equity marketing, on the other hand, equity marketing, the difference between the two is that equity marketing puts the emphasis on the benefit relationship of the owner to the property. Remember we said earlier, the only reason you should go out of title is because you don't have the benefits today that you're, you need. The only reason you should go into title on the property is because it's providing more benefits than what you already own, including cash. That all makes sense? And so in, in equity marketing, one of the things that we add to the marketing effort is to understand that we don't necessarily have to have the haver and the taker, meaning that if you want my property, you have to be offering cash. Because now there's a little tiny piece of the market. But for every, every person with cash and credit in the market for what I'm offering, there may be literally thousands and thousands of people who have the equity in something else, whether it's property or uh, something else that, that would like to have and would rather have my property than what they have. That's the difference with equity marketing. And we're going to explore that a whole, a whole lot more before the day is over. The people factor. What we need is for our clients to be able to understand what they're offering to the market, really. Oh, my property is absolutely <clears throat> wonderful because when we bought this house, we imported all of this marble from Italy and put it in the big foyer ugliest green lime green marble you ever saw in your whole life. Oh, it was awful. Everybody walked in the front door and said, whoa, I don't want to see that. <laughs> they didn't understand that the marble in the, in the foyer was a negative as opposed to a positive. 
And in those days, I didn't know enough about asking questions in order to get them to understand that. All right? Uh, but getting the, the, the person who is going to market to understand that they are, have to understand how the market is going to see what the benefits of their property. They may not even understand what the benefits of their property are. And we're going to talk about the discovery that comes from the process in a bit that, that will help you understand how you draw that information out. We also need them to, to recognize the benefits that are needed. I need out of management and into passive income. Why is that? I'm old, I have arthritis, I can't go to management. My wife is threatening to divorce me if I go down there and clean up one more uh, broken pipe at 2 o'clock in the morning, etc., etc. Pick one. Right? What is it that you need and why do you need that? And how long do you think that's going to be the benefit that you need? Does that make sense? So if somebody understands the benefits that they're offering to the market, and they understand what the benefits are that they need from the market, do you suppose that price and terms might be less important in the final decision? I can't tell you how many transactions I've seen fall apart over the years because they were arguing about a percent or half a percent on the seller financing or 2% on the price of the property. And, and they should have closed the transaction because it was good for everybody and they got hung up on price and terms. Because well, what's price and terms? Price and terms is win or lose, isn't it? If, if I get my price and terms and, and you have succumbed to that, then what? I win and lose. And a lot of people out there in the real estate world, a lot of professional investors, if you please, play the win lose game. And a lot of institutional investors play the win-lose game. Well, in my case, I want my owners to understand that we have brought them a transaction that provides the benefits that we have all agreed is what they need. And you know what? Almost the overwhelming majority of every time they say, oh yeah, that one works, we're our son. Or we need to make an offer on this property because it provides these benefits and we need to get a dialogue. You know, if she offers something, man, my client's just going to have a nosebleed for your listing. Except that what we're offering, <coughs> her people will say, what? Why are you talking to me about this? <laughs> you know? And so what I do is I go say, uh, by, by having my client sign a letter of intent, sign a contract offer, and I come over and present it to her, and she says, Jim, I think you're a little crazy, but my people are not even remotely going to do that. I said, look, <clears throat> suppose you go to your people, because my clients, I'm pretty sure, subject to some diligence, my clients really will close and take title to your property under these terms and conditions. If I can find a cash buyer for my property and, and we can close that simultaneously, so we get your property, but your guys get cash, you, you think they might do that? Think they might do that? <laughs> Well, we can write contracts, and we're going to show you how to do that later. Okay, and so the, the object of the game is that they understand what they're doing, and they will help you go and rip the doors off of the market. Different owners, this is a really important item. Why do any transactions close? Because different owners need to change different sets of benefits. If, if I'm going out of something that... that I don't like the benefits, why would I go into something that has the same benefits? Right? That makes sense? So the reason transactions close <coughs> is because I'm going, I'm giving up something that is not beneficial to me as I need today, and I'm going to close with you because you or your client is trying to go out of a set of benefits that do not fit them today, but by changing places we both win. That's what we have to be marketing is about. That's what this marketing session is about, is not putting transactions to closing, but identifying taker have connections from which you can build a transaction. Five takers. I go to market and I come back to the market. Whether I go to the market with on, on uh, CCIM net or 
get it off the internet, I can get it off the flyer, I get I call my network up, I get a sign, or I go to marketing sessions. But I find five people or five principals who will take my property, probably subject to some diligence, but they really are taking this for the benefits that I'm offering. Got a little, little 90,000 square foot shopping center in Winchester, Missouri. My daddy said, you know, the only reason you sell is for cash and you can only take cash. Well, the shopping center was making good money, a great location, hardly any competition. This guy, by the way, who owned it was like 88. And he had inherited it from his daddy, who built it literally with his own two hands. But he only wanted cash. And we couldn't find a cash buyer at that particular time. This was in a small town. You know, you're kind of halfway out there. You went further out, you're on the way back. And, <laughs> and so, but we found people in marketing sessions that said, oh man, I'll take that, absolutely. You know, here, and, and we made them all go to writing, at least a letter of intent, and, and signed by their principal. Does that carry a little more weight than crazy Jim Wilson calling me up and saying, you know, I think my people might do something so with you, right? So, see that guy in the middle? He's not offering real estate. He's Crazy Joe from New Jersey who's offering 10 train car loads of finished compost as the down payment on your restaurant building. How many of you jumped out of bed this morning and said, God, I can hardly wait to get 10 train car loads of compost? <laughs> However, the owner of the restaurant, they were closing that unit. They own 30 something restaurants within a 50, 75 mile radius, all of which had landscaping. And guess what? That unit closed. So just because somebody's offering something out of the ordinary, we're going to talk about that later, don't just write it off. But let me, here's the key every one of these people is offering something that my people don't want. Guys, I just want cash. Don't bring me all that junk. <laughs> One of the junks, by the way, was the airplane. Can you imagine an 88-year-old out of what? An airplane? I don't think so. But guess what? The airplane was cashing it. Right? So what I've done by getting these five deals, these five takers, is I now have six ways to get closing going on. And I recommend that when you when you Work with these people, you get as much information about what they're offering because now, you know, God bless them, you know, to Ted Blank and you say, Ted, I want to, you know, your people are looking for my property, but, ah, you know, we, we really don't want a condo in the weeds. And so he opens up and he keeps track of all of his takers. He says, how about one of these? <laughs> no, I want that one. How about one of these? You know, you want to buy a watch. So if you keep track of your takers, so what you've done is you now have six ways to get the closing instead of one. And now all I've got to do is have any one of these, the, the shopping center, any one of these five takers go to cash and what? I get the close and get paid. That's the part I like the best. My wife actually likes it better than me. Getting in the know, I'm going to give you a quick aside. So my 49th year in this business, and probably for the last probably close to 30 years. I have done almost all of my videos either from marketing sessions or with the network of people that I've gotten to know through going to marketing sessions. Because in, in a marketing session, it's real quick to pick out the people who have pieces from which you can assemble transactions that meet client needs. And you can get on the phone, if, you know, if you need to know about self storage, I mean, you really need to know about self storage, you call Chuck Sutherland. He's going to run this meeting. Because Chuck cut his teeth at the knee of Colby Sandman, who was the inventor of self storage in 1951. And Chuck built a whole city full of this stuff in square footage. Okay? So that's one of the benefits of, self, uh, uh, of coming to marketing sessions, is you get to know all these people. Multiplying the opportunities, separate the thinker and haver, 
here's how I do it. You know, you'll find the form in your book. They told me I had to have forms in the back of those things. But what I used to do is just take a form one, that's a piece of blank piece of paper, fold it in half, you know, and get a crease down the middle, and on the left, I would put down the benefits that I'm offering to the market. And then underneath that, I would start listing the categories of takers for the benefits I'm offering. I have a development site that ought to be subdivision lots in, uh, uh, you know, in, in medium, yeah. in, in segment between 25 and 50% tile in the price market. And I have half of the entitlements, the rest of them are probably going to happen. So those are the benefits what I'm offering. And so who's the logical taker for that? It's the builder, developers. You, know, you can go find them. I used to have an exercise that I did. I'd drive on my patio with a glass of iced tea or something. <laughs> and back in the days when we had phone books, it was called the Yellow Pages exercise. And I would sit out there with a the clipboard and I'd start through the Yellow Pages. And I'd turn the pages and say, who should be in here? You know, who on this page? What kind of, you know, this kind of property, this kind of owner? Who, and I would make a list of people. What are the categories of the people who ought to be takers for what I'm offering to the market? And then uh, under that, I might sit down and, and put uh, the, the importance of that or what I think the difficulty in locating those people. On the right hand side, I put the same information about the average. What are the benefits that we're looking for? Who's, who's the likely or what are the categories of likely takers? or have this for the benefits that we're looking for. I automatically just assume that I may have to take, have the haver and the taker separate into in order to get my client's objective fully uh, achieved, all right? And, and so I worked on that. I put you in the mindset so you're not thinking about where I'm going. Now, I identify how do I contact these people? You know, things like phone book, to run them online, I'll give you a trade secret that, that Lance Warner told me years ago. He said, go to the public courthouse, look on the deed, down at the bottom, it will tell you what attorney prepared the deed. Same way if it's got a recorded mortgage. You know, somewhere on there, it'll probably give you the name of the attorney that prepared that document. And whether it's a title company or a law firm or whatever, here, I'll contact the law firm and say, do you still have contact with these people? <laughs> Would you please get in touch with them and tell them that Jim Wilson represents some clients who are interested in making a written offer on their property. Written, signed, market offer on their property. And, and let them be your, your <laughs> go hold on to the people. And that works a lot, you know. Sometimes the, the, the attorneys still, they're still clients of the attorney. Sometimes they say, well, you know, gosh, you know, we're just a title company. But do you suppose you can find out, because we don't know who ABC LLC is, that you do. So would you go contact them and we'll pay you to do that if you will. And I've sent a $100 check to title companies two or three times for chasing down who the people are and how I get in touch with them. So I have to be able to get in touch with them in order to make a transaction happen. The next thing is, I then take a judgment call. Which of these is going to be the more difficult to accomplish? And is it going to be easier to find the, the, the taker, or is it going to be easier to find the have? So where are you going to put the first effort? Where are you going to start? Get the hard part done first. Whichever one's going to be the more difficult, that's the one you focus on first. Because when you get that piece in place, the next piece to close the transaction is less trouble with it. Right? That makes sense? So that's that's a strategy. Be a taker. It's a mindset. Be a taker. You know, she's offering what my clients want, and we know that they probably don't want our sewer plants or our 15,000 bottles of wine or fill in the blank other stupid stuff that I've ever wrote in the years. We know they're going to say no. But it doesn't, I don't care what your people want. I'm going to make you my offer and see if I can get a transaction started. Oh, by the way, what is it your people want? Oh, well, we want so-and-so. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Give us 90 days, and she and I'll work together, we'll go find you. Now, do the same thing. 
You know, they say to God, go see you. Hey, you have what they want. Hey, we'll have them write you an offer. <laughs> right? That makes sense? That's, see, be a taker. Don't care whether they want what you're offering. It's not important. We're going to talk about presenting in the marketing session. I'm going to say it now. Don't tell anybody what you want. Nobody cares. They don't. She doesn't care what we want. She only cares about what her client wants. Clients hung up on cash. If we limit our transactions only one in which the takers offer cash, we have severely limited our closing. We already talked about that once. So if we're willing to exchange for something that is more likely to go to cash than our property, isn't that the pathway we want to go down? If you really, really, really want cash, but there are no cash takers with cash and credit for what you're offering to the market, how do you get to closing? It's real simple. You've got to find somebody who will take what you're offering that will give you something that will get you to cash. Because otherwise, what? You're wasting your time, aren't you? You're not going to get paid. You're not going to have a closing. How might we understand taking and have a principle? We just talked about it. Now, I, I really, really, really need some cash. So why not exchange our equity for three free clear rental houses, which we can then uh, go to have the National Bank and get a mortgage on in order to get the cash that we absolutely have to have in order to pay Uncle Sam and not lose our office building and everything else we want. That work? Sure. We just, you know, you used to take your haver principle by separating the taker and haver and go to something that's more effective. Ask them, do you have a, you have a, a, a backup package? Do you have a whole bunch of property information or brochure? Can I have a copy? Because I need, because when I go up there and I say, well, you know what I'm, I got one of these. And, oh, by the way, I have this two pound backup package with all the information. We're gonna talk about how you prepare those packages. Uh, they did list the takers during the marketing effort, uh, attending and effectively participating in marketing sessions. Um, try to convert them whenever you have a taker or have, even if it's not a two-way transaction, convert it to writing in some fashion. Now we have what we call mini forms or preliminary transaction proposals on the tables. Uh, I've created one, you'll get a copy out of, out of this class. I've created one that starts to look like a contract. And it says, right, it's not a binding offer, but here's the deal that I'm proposing and it has an addendum, which the addendum looks just like the terms and conditions on a contract. It's amazing how that is. <laughs> you know? and, and I have my client sign that. So if I come to you and I say, would your people take my piece of junk over here? It's real easy to say, no. But if I come to you and I say, oh, I have, a, I have a, a, an offer signed, a letter of intent signed by my clients, then are you going to go talk to your people about it? You're not going to cut me off. Does that make sense? So that's where we're going with this. Participating in marketing, marketing sessions, as we said a little earlier, are not competitive. The competition is to see who can make the best presentation. The competition is to see who can contribute the most effectively to everybody getting to transactions that might close. Otherwise, marketing sessions are collaborative and cooperative because why didn't we say transactions go together and close? It's because I'm giving up what is less beneficial to me and walking away from closing with something that is more beneficial to me. And if you do this correctly, whether you've got three legs, or 12 legs, or 29, I was actually part of a 29 way exchange once 100 years ago. It took two years to get it done. And when, when they finally had the closing, everybody went to California and we had this big fun closing in a, in a meeting hall. And then we had a hell of a party back. It was, you know, it was kind of fun. But uh, the bottom line is, is whether you've got two ways or three ways or five ways, most two way transactions are what? Money for real estate. And the traditional exchange is real estate for real estate and money. Texas two state. 
because you know what I've got didn't draw the money, I exchange for something that will get the money. And so, but when you do that, you go to closing and everybody puts what they don't want into the center of the table and they take home what they do want. Isn't that what motivates a transaction to go to closing? That's the key, in my opinion. So it's not collaborative, I'm not competitive, it's collaborative and cooperative. And on that note, we are going to reach. The word counseling actually in real estate came from a fellow named Chuck Chad, who I was, I, I was blessed enough to actually know Chuck and go to his classes and stuff. And, and Chuck's attitude was, it's all about the people. And he took the concepts from psychology and psychological and psychiatric counseling and the questioning techniques and put them to work in order to help people understand their own needs and their own uh, situations and draw out of them. And we're going to talk about an important principle about not telling people what they don't want to hear. And on that note, we're going to take a break.